Well, thank you for all attending this conversation. It's going to be very exciting to hear from Deepak and Doug about this incredible collaboration and partnership between Saibin and the Chopra Foundation, because there's so many synergies. And I'd like to hear from both of you about what your goals are from this engagement. Shall I start? Please go sure. ahead. So, uh, mankind has been using psychedelics to heal for thousands of years. Um, and for the last several decades, we've had I know, so much re academic research uh, that tells us that psychedelics are really powerful in helping with depression and addiction. Um, however, we've also encountered this, this war on drugs that's been happening for decades as well. And that war on drugs has told us drugs are bad. And psychedelics have been classed uh, with other street drugs that are toxic and, and addictive, like cocaine and heroin. Um, and so there's, a, there's, a, there's an awful misunderstanding in uh, modern times ar around psychedelics. Uh, I was speaking with a, a scientist recently who <coughs> advises regulators, drug regulators, and his first reaction as we started telling him about our work was, oh, psilocybin, which comes from mushrooms, oh, that's, that's addictive, which is completely un untrue. Uh, psilocybin has been shown to be completely non-addictive and really not toxic. Uh, the toxic doses may be a thousand times a therapeutic dose. But there's all this misunderstanding out there amongst the general public, uh, policy makers, um, thought leaders, that are potential hurdles to bring these treatments uh, to people that need them. And the Chopra Foundation just has tremendous reach among all those groups. We're a small biotech company, 50 people. Uh, but the Chopra Foundation has reach across the public, across policy makers, uh, across thought leaders, and the process of changing minds takes a long time. That's not something that we can wait until we have an approval for. We have to start now. Uh, we have decades uh, of, of work to do to, to, to make this happen. And so we, we came to Deepak for help. <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing something. Deepak, I'd like to hear about your thoughts about this collaboration. I think it's so beautiful because of the knowledge and wisdom that you offer, which could be just an incredible compliment. I'll share with you some personal reasons, and then I'll share with you some scientific reasons. <laughs> the personal reasons come first. I was in medical school in the 60s. I joined medical school in 1964. This is a very interesting time. Uh, Timothy Leary had been kicked out of Harvard for experimenting with LSD. Um, the great spiritual teacher, uh, Ram Das, had also been kicked out. He was then Dr. Alpert at Harvard Medical School. And the Beatles were in the Himalayas with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And so just listen to this uh, extraordinary time. We were, in, and there was lots of other things happening. The feminist movement, Gloria Steinem was marching at, in Harvard Square, burning bras. Uh, you guys, most of you guys are not even familiar with those times. <laughs> there was the Greenpeace movement. There was the anti-war movement. The Vietnam War was at its stake, and every, Muhammad Ali was protesting against Vietnam. I thought we were living in a world that was going to change in five years. <laughs> Look where we are now. It's worse. Okay. So. 1965, four students from Harvard Medical School came as exchange students, exchange students to the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. I was a student there. And we had a Harvard professor who couldn't do experiments at Harvard, so he came to India. <laughs> And I was a participant in an experiment with medical students on two occasions with LSD. And the first experiment was um, just a kind of a controlled experiment with me and our students and control students to see if there was any difference. I had my first non-local experience, and now my email goes by non-local, <laughs> which is the whole story, but it was my first non-local experience. And then the second time that I had this occasion is, as students, we were looking at a poster of Mother Teresa. And those days, the rumor was in the media 
that Mother Teresa would lick the wounds of leprosy patients and they would be healed. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but in view of epigenetics, it could be true. So we were looking at a poster of Mother Teresa and I had the most compelling experience of what it means to experience compassion changed the course of my life. The most intense experience of what it means to have compassion, to be connected. Well, then, of course, the whole world collapsed. Okay, Vietnam was no longer an issue. The feminist movement continued, but in a very muted way. The peace movement became renegade in a sense with angry peace activists, which is not what we were, flower children, as we called ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so everybody that I now work with, from Bob Thurman to last recently uh, um, Ram Das, who was at our last Seduction of Spirit course, and many others are actually colleagues of mine from the past. So now I'm interested not only from the spiritual experience I had. And by the way, spirituality is confused with religion, but there is something called a religious experience, which is the same thing as a spiritual experience. And the religious experience includes three things. Number one, you find an identity which is non-local, beyond space-time. I found it in my first experiment, literally. Number two, there's the spontaneous emergence of what we call platonic values, truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy, equanimity. And number three is the loss of the fear of death. So at a very young age, I lost fear of death. I mean, what a rare gift that was, right? That's the original religious experience. Go to Islam, go to uh, Christianity, Buddhism, that's the only three things. If you find a non-local identity, if you feel love and compassion and truth and goodness and beauty and harmony, and you don't fear death, I think you're all set. <laughs> okay? <laughs> then there is only joy. Can and you that explain was... non-local identity? Non-local means beyond space and time, not subject to birth and death. The birth and death are to the body and to the mind and to the ego, perhaps. Perhaps. But it actually... Ego doesn't die because it recycles. Mm -hmm. Other people in religious traditions call that reincarnation. Mm -hmm. Okay, but so non-local means you know that your true identity is not in space-time. That space-time is an experience. Like this is an experience. Space is an experience, and space is infinite, and therefore embedded in the infinite is the dark, deep secret of time, past, present, and future what people call psychic abilities. They're all non-local dormant potentials. Okay, so I found that in my 20s. And, and so that triggered my interest. Now it's science. So <coughs> psychedelics, by and large, and I will ask Geeta, I'm being very careful because she's the expert uh, on science. But psychedelics decrease the activity of a part of our brain called the default mode network. The default mode network is the neural correlate of our ego identity. So as our ego identity dissolves, we have the experience of non-locality. Now we know what's happening in the brain through PET scans and other things. Mm. The other thing that psychedelics seem to do, and we're still trying to figure out the pathways, decrease inflammation, they act on neurotransmitters, the usual ones that we know, serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, and there's a new one called anandamide, which is a beautiful name for a <laughs> neurochemical. It means the peptide of bliss. Mm -hmm. And now it's a, an accepted term in science, okay? So psychedelics work by triggering neurotransmitters and this may or may not happen, but now there's a lot of in, uh, in research on anti-aging. Mm -hmm. And there's some information that they may affect what we call signaling molecules. Signaling molecules are things like um, oh, NAD, NMN. These are signaling molecules that actually help self-regulate 
homeostasis, but also decrease inflammation, but also help repair DNA. So now what people are saying is that DNA damage is the cause of aging. And aging should be considered a disease. And it sh it, just because we see everyone happening it, you know, if you thought of everybody uh, has diabetes or most people have diabetes, you, you, you know it's a disease. Okay, but some people don't, right? So what's their secret? So now there's research on what we call signaling molecules, many of them, but predominantly what are called NAD boosters and others, quercetin, fisetin, CA, MP, lots of fancy names. But these signaling molecules also help self-repair in DNA. So if you could stop self-repair in DNA, you could use signaling molecules to cut out what is called epigenetic noise. So epigenetic noise is best handled through meditation and vagal stimulation, deep breathing and yoga. But epigenetic noise means there's a lot of background noise. Like when you switch on your TV, you see this, you know, that fuzzy things before the image is heard. Or when you're tuning in your radio, FM to AM, you hear this noise. Okay, that's a metaphor, but there's noise in our genes, around our genes because of stress. And so mindfulness training enhanced by psychedelic experiences under supervision like people like doctors like um, uh, Dr. Ved, who's an expert, it has many applications. Terminal care, one of my literary agents passed away recently. She had breast cancer that had metastasized uh, uh, to the brain and some people in this room know who she is. She came to Malika's wedding and in the last week I, uh, with Gita's help, we assisted her to go on what people call the other side. But if you're non-local, then there are infinite lokas and that's what the Buddhists say all these years. But now we're looking at it from non-local dynamics and quantum physics and mathematics. So we took her through this journey. She was so happy. Not only did she, did, she died in, die in peace, she was euphoric, looking forward to it. So terminal care, end of life care. There's something in end of life called terminal lucidity. Some people, uh, whether they have Alzheimer's or they have paralysis, they have stroke, some people, a small percentage of them, and I asked Rudy about this, then I asked many other scientists, some people, even with dementia, just before they die, they have lucidity. They see dead uh, relatives, even pets. Now, there's a whole different explanation from non-local dynamics of that, which is scientific, but not yet accepted by science, will be as the future unrolls, but they lose their fear of death because they see other lokas. And, you know, those lokas are dreamscapes just in the way this is a dreamscape. Uh, this is dreamscape. We think it's real, but it's a dreamscape. Okay. So terminal care, end of life um, care, terminal lucidity, um, depression, anxiety, and now because anxiety and depression is linked to chronic disease, chronic disease as well. Those are just the beginning. Now, much of this research needs to be done. So thanks to our partnership, we now hopefully will have the ability to do meta-analysis because we don't have to replicate all the research. You can do computer meta-analysis and see what's happening. And what's happening is nothing short of remarkable. It's a revolution. Deepak, what is the difference between, what is it, so the mushrooms? Psilocybin. Psilocybin, yeah. Psilocybin, mushrooms, yeah. yeah and the LSD. LSD is a chemical that's produced uh, through synthesis. It, although it is derived from a fungus, but right now it comes, uh, it's, a, it's manufactured mm -hmm. like a chemical. And it is not the same chemical as psilocybin, it's different. So there's psilocybin, there's something called ibogaine, there's LSD, there are ketamine, which is now approved by the FDA, and um, uh, ayahuasca, they're all different, but 
and they may not have the same mechanisms. I'll leave that up to you. They're all different molecules. They all have psychoactive properties. They're all hallucinogens, and they act differently and have different signatures. And how would you know what a person need, would need, for instance? What would, what, yeah, well, what is it that would delineate for you in your mind? You know, think, okay, here's what I'm going to use on that person for this reason. Well, thank you for asking that question because this opens up to asking about the research that's needed. We need to do a lot more research to get that nuanced about it, but perhaps that could segue mm. into asking Doug a little bit about the trends you're seeing. Yeah, that's a good question because, of course, we've known about these molecules for centuries. So why aren't they uh, available as medications yet? And that's because we don't really understand everything about them. And, and there are some limitations. So for me, the, the really powerful thing about the, the potential for psychedelics to treat depression or addiction is that unlike the treatments we use today, where you go to your pharmacy and you take a pill every day, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, psychedelics have the potential, and we've seen this in academic studies at NYU and the Johns Hopkins, the potential to uh, free someone of their depressive symptoms or their addictive cravings for weeks or months at a time from just one or two treatments. So that's a complete paradigm shift. and It's, it's a complete change to healthcare, uh, yeah. mental healthcare. Uh, so what we're doing at Cybin is we're taking derivatives and analogs of psilocybin and DMT and MDMA and trying to overcome some of those limitations to make them into prescription uh, therapeutics. And our view is that going down that road uh, helps to convince uh, patients and healthcare providers that these are safe and that they're effective, mm -hmm. uh, but also ultimately to get to reimbursement. Because if you want to, if you want to support patient access and get access to the, the all, 900 million people around mm -hmm. the world are affected mm -hmm. by addiction, depression, mm -hmm. or an eating disorder, then you need reimbursement. Someone's got to pay for right. these things. Um, so the, some of the limitations are, and you asked about LSD and, 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 and psilocybin, they're clinically pretty similar. Um, LSD though has a duration, a treatment duration of maybe 10 hours or so, so very, very long time. That doesn't really fit within our healthcare system. Mm. Uh, psilocybin about the same, six to eight hours potentially, so a little shorter but still challenging for the healthcare system. Mm. So one of the, one of the simpler um, uh, challenges trying to overcome is making these treatments shorter. So shorter durations of patients, so physicians can see more patients per day, more practical within the healthcare system, more scalable. Uh, but then also uh, psilocybin, for example, is highly variable. So one patient might have a, a very moderate response, another might have a very profound response. Mm -hmm. And in psychiatry, the last thing you want is unpredictability. Mm -hmm. okay. So tr uh, tr cre creating treatments that are predictable, shorter acting, and ultimately reimbursable is what we're trying okay. to do. That's the goal. So what happens in, when you have your doctor with you? <laughs> Obviously, you're there with the person who's undergoing this treatment. How do you perform your, your duty? What, what is it that you do this uh, gets into to the, help the person? Yeah, yeah. So this gets into the importance of the molecules and the development of molecule, molecules that can be more practical. And also, what is the context, right, and the treatment approaches, which really change considerably. Deepak, could you say something about the treatment, the context of psychotherapy? Because I think what you're, what you're picking up, Goldie, is that it's a paradigm shift, right? It's not business as usual, mm -hmm. it really gets into what Deepak talked about, which is, I think in your introduction, how it really gets into personal healing, wellness, growth. Could you talk a little bit about how this interfaces with some of um, mindfulness, creativity, compassion, some of the other components? Because it shifts it from just symptom release to healing, real wellness and growth. I get that. Uh -huh. What I'm interested in is the actual activity. Okay, there's a person there. Oh, I see. Administered this. So we uh, let me give you an example. Okay, okay. okay. so we talk about the session we did. For yeah, the session okay. we did, but now we did. We've created a protocol where we sit with the patient. I mean, this is not public yet. It will be. We're okay. creating it. Uh, so you sit with the patient. Right now, the way we've done it a couple of times right. is I take them through meditation. A reflection, uh, deep reflection on who they think they are, you know, difference between ego and spirit. But I don't teach them anything. I just take them into a meditation, mindfulness practice, mm -hmm. breathing practice, and they've taken the reflection. Then Gita administers the um, the whatever the agent is. Right now it's ketamine, and we can talk about low dose, micro dose too. Right. 
But then after the session, we engage again the patient or client, I hate the word client, but participant. Um, we engage them again in reflection and meditation to see what shifted. Okay, so that's the protocol we're developing. It's not yet. And I don't have to teach the meditation. We can record it and we can create a standard pro protocol that can go to a hospital setting. So that's the that's what we're going to do as these molecules get identified. What is the context? Because everybody doesn't come to this depression or anxiety from the same context. Right. Yeah. Somebody is having a marital situation problem. Another person has lost his job. Another is most more insecure about you know their tendency for psychosis or suicide because somebody in their family had it. So you need to know the context. It needs to be personalized. And then you will we'll develop protocols that are more contextual. Good, yeah. But we're not there yet. Got it. Okay, now, one thing that you mentioned, and I, I shared this at the risk of being politically incorrect. And I know this is being live streamed or whatever, but <laughs> what, what the heck. OK, so I have written four books on religious experience. One's called Jesus' Story of Enlightenment. The other is called Buddha, a story of enlightenment. The third is uh, Muhammad, the story of the last messenger of God. And the fourth is called God, a history of revelation, starting from the Old Testament right down to Einstein. So obviously I had to do a lot of research. And so one day it occurred to me that when the manna fell down from the heavens, Moses in the desert, that was fungus. <laughs> okay, that's why they all became, Moses is known as the, as the person who shifted their reality. They saw Red Sea parting and all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> he was on a psychedelic journey. Yeah, he was a psychedelic journey. Then I was reading, of course, everyone knows that Jesus turned water into wine, right? Bet you those casks had some fungus. <laughs> okay. Doesn't mean these weren't religious experiences, okay? Now, I haven't found any documentation for the other guys, Muhammad and Buddha, Buddha yet, but who knows? If you read the Rig Veda, the ninth and tenth mandala, all the hymns are all the hymns are about Soma. Soma is considered a god. And we don't know what Soma was, but it looks like it was a psychedelic because they have rituals around Soma, and that's what the shamans do. And to complete the story, you know, 2002, when my father passed away, uh, we were taking his ashes up the Ganges to uh, Haridwar, and uh, we were going in this taxi. And we saw all these sadhus. Anybody know sadhus, monks, mendicants, and Shaivites? They're, they're dressed like Shiva would be, almost naked, snakes and other things around them, and, you know, uh, trishul and ash. Uh, and it obviously, it looked like they were not in this world. So I asked the driver, I said, what are they smoking? He said, ganja, sir, ganja, which is a cannabis derivative, psychedelic. And Shiva used to apparently smoke ganja. So, and that's called the left-hand path to enlightenment, agora. And so my brother said to the driver, he said, can we get some? <laughs> and the driver said, no, sir, you have to be enlightened. <laughs> So that's the history of psychedelics in India. <laughs> you have to be enlightened. <laughs> but I will go back to your question. A couple of things. I think what you touched on is there's different preparation. You have to prepare an individual for a journey, and it's very individualized for the person. And then in the experience itself, there's really deep learning that happens where the person does really attend to themselves. And some of that, the facilitator will influence, which like Deepa says, you can have tools that you can assist with meditations and techniques that help the person be able to better navigate the experience. Mm -hmm. And what it really does is it taps into inner healing intelligence, which allows for this balance and homeostasis and regulation 
So it's very in sync with the, the wisdom and knowledge that have been held in, you know, in Eastern traditions and other traditions for centuries. It really activates, in a way, this really nice fusion between modern and past. Mm -hmm. So there is a whole process that happens, and at the end, there is a, together a working through of what was really understood and gleaned. And it taps into the knowledge, the wisdom, and the poetry in the mind and body that we all hold. Mm, it's interesting. Yeah, it's really a really interesting, interesting process. And, and it's not just subjective either. Uh, Deepak, you mentioned meta-analysis. If you do a meta-analysis of uh, clinical studies with, with uh, psychedelics, those that don't use psychological support of some kind, uh, yes. the results are far less impressive. Uh, so th we know that that support, that preparation, and the integration is very important for to get better better outcomes. Uh, so yeah, I always always wonder if, the co if it's also cognitive. Oh yeah, you know, they, absolutely. You know, have absolutely. to work with their co cognition. Oh yeah, yeah, oh. and also the, the cognitive expectations and the context yes. and the environment determine the response, right? Well, that's a really interesting study. This, this is, they talk about set and setting influence the treatment, and if you think about it, the idea that an environment can influence a chemical. It's pretty radical, but that's what this really means. That's why when we have this preparation with Deepak and myself, preparing by being present, dropping into a meditation, it opens up the process both in the room but also in the person to access and use the whole field to open up into their own internal healing fields catalyzed by the medicine. So it's a really radically different approach. Can people be on, in other words, can they still be on sort of a psychotropic? Uh, drug or you know whatever Lexapro or it depends on which chemical we're talking about. Yes. Ah yes. So we might need to re questions. repeat the questions you are asking about. Um, can can people take psychedelic medicines if they're already taking uh, a psychotropic medicine such as Lexapro? And the answer really depends on it depends on the substance involved. And I think this gets into your area yeah, you're working on. Th there's been there have been a few small studies recently that have shown that uh, patients remaining on their SSRIs, that's what these molecules are, um, is either neutral or slightly positive. So that's good. I mean, there's n there doesn't appear to be an interaction or any safety issues. Mm -hmm. From a practical point of view, we have to we have to expect psychedelics to be used as adjunctive therapies alongside gotcha. SSRIs because. These treatments have to be, patients have to be weaned off of them over many, many weeks. And it's just not practical to ask someone come all the way down off of their SSRI, have a psychedelic treatment and then ramp back up again. Uh, so we have to, we, and this is what we're doing, we're trying to design studies using the two together uh, to remove those barriers. Right, yeah. and that's probably less fearful for people who do need yeah. Yeah. To work. You know, well, to you're right. Grow. Also, when patients come off of those SSRIs, they can have rebound effects oh, for terrible. many months it at a time. Be terrible. Yeah. 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 But there are some medicines like ketamine and others that can be used where there aren't interactions. So it really depends. And it's also interesting to think about microdosing. Yeah, that's what I was going to yes. ask. Could you, you tell us a little bit well, about microdosing? No, no, you should uh, talk. Well, you're the uh, expert. Okay. <laughs> She's <laughs> asking me questions. She knows the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to hear from you or your uh, perspective. No, no, I think microdosing is being experimented with, and there's no better person than, uh, than Gita who's actually uh, leading this. So microdosing is very small doses and rapid effect, like, you know, you can have a 15-minute, 20-minute session and you're done. And you don't actually have the, the intense, uh, um, what you say, hallucinogenic or experience or the non-local experience. You may not have that, but it's a, a safety net for a lot of people who are scared. You know? And in some ways it can be more profound. I was actually talking to a colleague who was talking about right now we're in the psychedelic renaissance and the next wave will be the psycholytic renaissance, which are the lower doses. Because in the lower doses you may not go beyond yourself, but you actually open into yourself, which in some ways is no less of a spiritual experience to find yourself. Okay. So this is so interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But and Deepak, I'd like to hear about meditation, mindfulness, creativity. There's a lot of questions that people are interested in. I think we have a big session on that in the uh, and uh, in our main Lake Nona forum as okay. well. But yes, mindfulness, and we have a session with Goldie and Gabriella as well okay. on suicide prevention, along with Kenneth Cole. So all these things will come up, but. Uh, uh, there's no question that mindfulness training and even reflective self-inquiry and mantra meditation, which is, you know, TM, primordial sound, 
they all have very profound effects on the epigenome. So our first study, which you were a participant in, Goldie Hawn, you were a participant <laughs> in that study, the self-directed biological transformation study. We saw within a week of mindfulness training, the telomerase level went up by 40%. And that study was co-authored, published in a peer-reviewed British Nature Translational Psychiatry Journal, caught the attention of the world. And uh, our co-author was Elizabeth Blackburn, who's a Nobel laureate for discovering telomerase. And telomerase went up, which is the enzyme that regulates the biological clock, uh, telomere lengths, went up by 40%. Now, there's nothing known in the world that does that other than meditation so far. Now, other people have replicated that, maybe with variations, 40%, 20%, but telomerase goes up, telomeres lengthen. The genes that are responsible for self-regulation or homeostasis go up, some of them 17-fold over baseline. Uh, genes that are responsible for inappropriate inflammation go down including genes for heart disease, diabetes, cancer, metabolic syndrome, Alzheimer's, significantly. So when we've had our first meeting, no one knows this, but it's public now, one of our co-investigators was Eric Schott from NYU, one of the most brilliant scientists known in the world of genetics. So yeah, this science paper presented at a science conference. Actually, sages and scientists also, he presented. Somebody in the audience said, Dr. Shah, do you meditate? He said, no. He said, are you going to meditate? He said, no. He said, well, you just showed us the data. You know, inflammation goes down, <laughs> genes go up, <laughs> telomerase goes up. Why don't you meditate? He said, well, I'm going to figure out how to make a drug out of this. <laughs> That's, and guess what? He left Mount Sinai, he joined the drug company, and they are figuring out the metabolic pathways. Yeah. So, you know, well, there will soon be something exactly. that will replicate that experience, maybe not in its entirety, because meditation is a whole different experience, no, but the science is there. That once you know the metabolic pathways, you might be able to replicate that. But I'm looking That's forward really for those techniques to be bridged and worked with the psychedelics and, and together I think there will be a much more interesting conversation between these different practices. And I, I, yeah. Please. Yes. I also wish to say that there is also a broadening of paradigm in, in the healing because here we still, if we talk about the molecule and the patient and the protocol and so forth, Sometimes, we, what in the Western paradigm, we yes. leave out that the molecule itself is an energy yes. and also has to be, um, you know, prepared to enter yes. into contract mm -hmm. in the healing process. Mm -hmm. So yes. the practices that we have from the tradition of Africa, for instance, that I know the best, uh, you know, the preparation of the, 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 molecule, the, the itself. molecule itself and the rituals that are put together, it's, uh, it's, it's to structure or help the uh, molecule or structure an energy, actually. Mm -hmm. Thank that, you for bringing that, that up. That, that is a paradigm. That you should tell everybody what, yeah. where you're from Thank and you. what your work yes. is. Yes, I, that's, that's so... Yes. From the Democratic yes. Republic of Congo. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm, que I'm queen of the Lutu people uh, of Kasai, and also I'm a high priestess of, of a Batala or Sar, so I'm initiated into also the order of the leopard. So mm -hmm. healing, of course, is really something mm -hmm. of, of, of essence, and also community, is a, a, because you cannot mm -hmm. just heal the individuals. Mm -hmm. the, 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 pro the, the problematic from, for us, on my paradigm, is that it's oftentimes only geared to a person, a person yes. experience, while disconnecting the person experience from the entire community yes. that is small first and then large to the entire global community of, human, of humanity. So the, yes. the, all these are aspects that I, I wish to see in research to be put in, to be considered by bringing those ancient you know, wisdom and voices to see that there is an entire process on up, upstream about the molecule itself. It's not a thing, it's, no. it's an energy and it, and it, and it yes. can be tailored and personalized Two for, for specific situation. How much time do we have? See if I can finish time. <laughs> <laughs> so, on my desk are the ninth and tenth mandala of the Rig Veda. 
If you bring it, yeah, I'll read yeah. one or yeah, two hymns beautiful. as yeah. a close. Yeah. Thank you so much for adding that comment. I think that's so nuanced and so beautiful and such an important mind. Uh, I just want to, to associate that to an example. So, for instance, we know some plant treats certain diseases because yes. you know we have the, the scientific experiments and stuff like that but when a patient comes you can have two patients coming in with the same symptoms and maybe the same measured uh, you know, disease because they yes. do blood work let's say both patients comes with um with um, let's say diabetes yes yet again when we're going to go to the forest to harvest the the, the plants that the forest will offer into for treatment the two uh, might completely be different plants for the same symptoms and the same disease. Mm -hmm. But once you have a dialogue with, with nature that is much more potent, so again, we're yes. connecting the healer and the, the patient or the client or the person with the understanding that it's an ecosystem that's much broader, mm -hmm. will be where the nature and the interaction will give a prescription and a process that will be so different for two different people, mm -hmm. but with this, with the, and even with different plants for the same to act to, to to bring back the homeostasis of the individual but community is always you know to be mind the, the entire community the plant community the earth community the water community people all these has to be uh, put in and 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 encompassed for so here it's going to be not just say oh it's a this molecule fix this this molecule make you feel this it's going to be also a process i suppose where we're going to broaden our paradigm and explode the the, the hal it's very ha allopathic much paradigm it's very much person i think the way you describe it almost like i just through what the experience in a psychedelic experience is to actually see those interconnections mm -hmm. internally and externally and how we are part of the whole matrix together so thank you so much for sharing that. through the rituals of your tradition the thank rituals you. of the shamans mm -hmm. of south america and the ancient rishis so if you look behind you that's a photo of me with my teacher maharishi mahesh yogi who brought uh, Transcendental Meditation to the West. There is a picture inside um, my office, similar. These are gifts from Maharishi, and these are hymns of the Rig Veda, 9th and 10th Mandala. And we had a practice, a very advanced, uh, I don't know if Suhas remembers this, but we had a very advanced uh, meditation practice from the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, um, which involved a form of levitation and uh, afterwards we would recite these hymns we didn't know what these hymns were at that time so this whole book is dedicated to psychedelics mm -hmm. and it goes back the Rig Veda and so here I'll read you may I read please, a hymn? Please do. This is a hymn uh, from the ninth mandala uh, six, chapter six, the deity and the meter as before, a lot of instructions, ritual instructions, who's the priest, what's the sacrifice, what's the fire ceremony, and now here's the hymn. The shining soma being purified by the golden hand that urges it forth, brings its juice into contact with the gods. When effused, it proceeds with a roar to the filter like the ministrant priest to the halls prepared for sacrifice. The great wise Soma, clothed in his auspicious war vestments, the inspirer of praises, enters the vessels when purified. You, thou art sagacious and vigilant at the banquet of the gods. Soma, the most famous of the same famous, the earth-born, the conciliator is cleansed from us in the elevated mind, sound aloud in the firmament when purified, do you ever protect us with blessings. Let us praise the gods, let us praise the gods, send forth the Soma for the acquirement of great wealth and healing. He passes sweet flavored pure through the fleecy filter and devoted to the gods alights in our sacrifice. It's a very long hymn, but you get the idea, okay? Uh, this hymn goes on. So you can see that this hymn was part of the ritual of psychedelic healing, Soma. An entire mandala devoted to it in the Rig Veda, which we don't know 
is the most ancient text in Sanskrit uh, for spiritual healing. The most ancient text. That's so great. Did you take any closing thoughts? Want to wrap up this panel? Yeah, I'd like to wrap up the panel by just a few more comments from both of you. But where do you think that this is going? What is the future of in the next five, ten years? What do you see hmm. anticipate happening with psychedelic medicine and healing? Well, clearly uh, there's more of an acceptance that uh, there's something here, right? That there's real power. Uh, of these these molecules and the treatment uh, combined, we've got a, a bit of a way to go to convince FDA to have a, that kind of uh, mindset and uh, to look at the the the, the, the whole data, uh, so not just the molecule but the the, the treatment pro protocol as well. Uh, but I'm hopeful in within five years we'll, we may see the first of these treatments being approved. Um, but that's only that's one step. The next step, of course, is reimbursement. That's really Im critically important. But then we also have to change mindsets a little. What we've talked about here is a very different way of, of treating and healing. It's, it requires investment to, the, from the patient. Mm -hmm. we're, not good at, we're not good at investing in ourselves. Uh, it's easier to go and take a, a pill from the pharmacy than to spend a few hours readying yourself, taking a treatment, and then learning from it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got some work to do. Not, it's not just about getting through the regulators, but educating and informing. Uh, folks are how best to take care of themselves. It's a very important piece. Thank mm. you so much. I think, you know, the challenge in all these areas is what is called category error. You try to explain one paradigm through another paradigm. This is what you were saying, uh, that we're trying to, there's a category error here sometimes when you transpose experiences from the spiritual healing traditions and then the totally scientific approach, which is, if you don't do it, it becomes irrelevant in our times. So the challenge is to bring the traditions and the science together and not do away with it, the context, the mm. ritual. It's very important. You know, when we started practicing mantra meditation, and there was a revolution with Benson and everybody. And, you know, oh, by the way, does everyone know that Dr. Benson passed away yes. a week ago? Okay, so he was one of our early collaborators. That was a loss. Right? Yeah, it was a big loss. But one thing Dr. Benson did, he tried to secularize totally mantra meditation. And in my view, it lost a bit of its beauty. Not entirely, because we could at least replicate scientific uh, Thing. So I think when we say context, meaning, meditation, mindfulness, maybe AI in the future, music, all comes together, we'll truly have an integrative approach. And it'll take a little time. The, our collaboration right now is before even they're out there legally except for ketamine. Our collaboration is for research and public awareness. And this is the first event um, of public awareness. And I hope it will strike a chord. All of you guys listening in the world, get involved and uh, check out the Chopra Foundation website. This video will be there and recycled endlessly, I hope, because there's a lot of stuff here that the world is unaware of. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.